In the second section of Chapter 1, we will focus on key elements of physical chemistry that provide a foundation understanding cellular reactions and enzyme kinetics. These include the major types of chemical reactions and the energy changes inherent within them. First, let's take a look at reversible reactions. If we consider the reaction A plus B being converted to the products P plus Q over time, we can imagine a few different scenarios. In this first scenario shown here, this is a reversible reaction where the reactants and products are equally favored. Shown on the graph is the concentration of one of those reactants, A, and one of the products, P. You can see that over time, as the reaction proceeds, the concentration of the reactants decreases and the concentration of the products increases until they reach the same level and stabilize at equilibrium. Recall that at equilibrium, the reaction is still proceeding and dynamic. There is just no net gain or loss in reactants or products as the rate of the forward reaction and the reverse reaction is the same. In scenario two, the reverse reaction is favored. In scenario two, the reverse reaction is favored over the forward reaction causing an accumulation of reactants over time. This is seen in the reaction graph showing that some product is formed, but that when equilibrium is reached, the concentration of reactants are higher than that of products. In scenario three, the forward reaction is favored, causing an accumulation of more product than reactant at the point that equilibrium is reached. We will also find that some reactions are irreversible in nature and are driven to completion. Note that the forward products are not shown in this graph, only the complete consumption of the reactants. For reactions that are reversible and reach an equilibrium state, they can be defined mathematically by an equilibrium constant called KEQ or K equilibrium due to the stability and nature of the equilibrium state. For this, we need to take into account a fully balanced equation where the correct molar equivalents are shown. This is indicated in our equation here by the lowercase letters in front of the reactants and products, such that we can now define KEQ as the concentration of the products raised to the power of the molar equivalent over the concentration of the reactants, also raised to the power of the molar equivalent. This helps us define the dynamic nature of the reaction and the static nature of equilibrium. Regardless of whether we perturb the system by adding more reactants or more products or do the opposite, remove products or remove reactants, there must be a shift in the concentration of the other amounts such that they maintain the equilibrium state at the characteristic constant level. Because KEQ is defined by the products in the numerator and the reactants in the denominator, a K equilibrium that is greater than one indicates that the products are favored, whereas a K equilibrium that is less than one implies that the reactants are favored. If it is exactly one, then the products and the reactants are equally favored. Recall from general chemistry that the spontaneity of a reaction is measured by the change in Gibbs free energy, termed delta G. Delta G is influenced by two different pairs of factors. The first pair is the concentration of reactants and products and the inherent reactivity of the reactants compared to the products. These are the chemical characteristics of the compounds themselves. The second pair of factors includes enthalpy and entropy changes. For example, consider the two reactions shown. The top reaction is showing hydrochloric acid with water, and the lower reaction is showing acetic acid with water. At time zero, there will be no product formed yet, and we will just be placing 0.1 moles of each acid into the water. 
When equilibrium is reached, there is essentially no HCl left in solution. This reaction has gone to completion. Whereas 99% of the acetic acid remains. Why is that? All we can say is there's something about the structure of HCl that makes it intrinsically less stable in water than the acetic acid. This is reflected in the K equilibrium for each reaction, which is much greater than 1 for HCl and much less than 1 for acetic acid. Thus, intrinsic stability of the molecule is one factor that contributes to delta G. The other factor in the first pair is concentration. For example, if we added 0.25 moles per liter of acetic acid to a solution of water, this solution will not conduct electricity, suggesting that very little ionization of the acid has occurred. However, if we add more concentrated acid to the solution, this will drive the formation of the product, and the solution will conduct electricity. This is an example of Le Chatelier's principle, which states that if a reaction at equilibrium is perturbed, the reaction will be driven in the direction that will relieve the perturbation. So conclusions we can make from Le Chatelier's principles are, if more reactant is added, the reaction shifts to form more product. If more product is added, the reaction shifts to form more reactants. If products are selectively removed by distillation, crystallization, or further reaction to produce another species, the reaction will shift to form more product. If reactants are removed, the reaction shifts to form more reactants. If heat is added to an exothermic reaction, the reaction shifts to get rid of the excess heat by shifting to form more reactants. The opposite occurs for an endothermic reaction. So we can think of this first pair of factors in a more mathematical way to help us define delta G of the reaction. We can first say that it is equal to the change in free energy associated with the intrinsic stability of the reactants as well as the change in free energy associated with the concentration of reactants present. Delta G naught is used to reflect the contribution from the intrinsic stability of the reactants and products and differentiate it from the overall delta G of the reaction. The component of delta G that is dependent on the concentration of reactants and products can be further defined as RT times the natural log of Q of the reaction, where R is the gas constant, T is the temperature in Kelvin, and QRx is the reaction quotient, which reflects the concentration of the products over the reactants. Thus, the change in Gibbs free energy can be simplified to this equation. Recall that if delta G is less than zero, the reaction is spontaneous or exergonic. If delta G is zero, the reaction is at equilibrium. And if delta G is greater than zero, the reaction is endergonic or not spontaneous. So if we look at the two acids from our previous reactions, we can characterize the reactions according to these following characteristics. We know that for HCl, that the intrinsic stability of the molecule favors the products, whereas for acetic acid, it favors the reactants. For both reactions starting at time zero, there will be a shift in the reaction such that the reaction will move to the right towards the formation of the product. As no products have been formed yet at T0, thus products will form until equilibrium is established. The combination of these two factors leads to the overall delta G of the reaction. Once equilibrium is reached, you can see that the two pairs of factors have reached equivalency such that neither factor favors a shift to the reactant or product side. They essentially cancel each other out, and the reaction remains at equilibrium. So what is the significance of delta G naught? One thing that we know is that it's independent of concentration, and it does not change. So think about the reaction at equilibrium. 
What do we know about the value of delta G at equilibrium? It's zero, right? So at equilibrium, delta G will equal zero. So at equilibrium, delta G naught will equal the negative RT natural log of the quotient of the reaction. We then know that this reaction is at equilibrium and we can substitute in K equilibrium. Thus, our equation reduces to delta G naught equals negative RT natural log of K equilibrium. And we can convert this to a standard log equation if needed. Thus, depending on a given problem, we can potentially calculate a value for delta naught G that can help us further evaluate delta G of a reaction under different conditions. For example, not at equilibrium. So what happens if in our equation all of the concentrations are at one molar? Well, the concentration factor reduces to zero. And we find that under this circumstance, that the delta G of the reaction will be equal to the delta G naught value. For example, the reaction will be independent of concentration and only be affected by the intrinsic reactivity of the molecules. This is defined as the standard state when the delta G of the reaction equals delta G naught. So at this point, we introduce a new symbol for the steady state, which is delta G naught prime. Standard conditions also define the temperature and pressure conditions of the reaction to a pressure of one atmospheres and 25 degrees centigrade. This helps us to evaluate energy flow within a system. For example, if we look at reaction A, we can see that the conversion of ATP to ADP is going to yield a delta G naught prime of negative 7.3 kilocalories per mole. That is in the forward direction of the reaction. If we look at our table, we can also see that the breakdown of creatine phosphate will yield negative 10.3 kilocalories per mole. That is in the reverse direction for our reaction. So for the forward reaction of creatine to creatine phosphate, our delta G naught prime will be positive 10.3 kilocalories per mole. Thus, our overall delta G naught prime will be the sum of these values going in the forward direction or negative 7.3 plus positive 10.3, which equals a positive 3.0. So that we know that reaction A under steady state conditions is not spontaneous. Practice calculating G naught prime for reactions B through D. What did you get for C? Hopefully what you found is negative 7.3 for the ATP to ADP conversion and positive 14.8 for the pyruvate to phosphoenyl pyruvate, which equals plus 7.5 for the overall reaction and not spontaneous. We calculated delta G naught prime on the last slide. Can you use that information to calculate K equilibrium? Here's a hint. Think about the reaction at equilibrium. Did you use this equation to come up with your final answer? First, fill in the known values, checking to be sure that your units match and will cancel out. Solve the problem down to the log and then exponentiate. Once in the exponential form, you can solve for K equilibrium. This number turns out to be much, much less than one, indicating that the reaction favors the reactant side. Note that reactions in the body are not typically at equilibrium or at the steady state. These are conditions that we use in the lab to help us understand the nature of a reaction. The two fluctuating components then in a reaction are temperature and the concentration of the reactants and the products. 
in vivo, it's not likely that you can vary the temperature very much to significantly impact the rate of a reaction. In vivo, the main driver will be the concentration of the reactants and the products. Thus, if you have a highly unfavorable reaction, such as the one that we've been discussing, removing the product from the area as it's formed can drive the reaction in the forward direction. So Le Chatelier's principle is very important in vivo. Enthalpy and entropy are also important components that can affect the overall change in Gibbs free energy within a reaction. Do you remember the equation that relates these terms from general chemistry? Yes, the change in Gibbs free energy is equal to the change in enthalpy within a system minus the temperature in Kelvin times the change in entropy. This equation is more useful in the lab when studying isolated systems. The final concept I want to remind you of before we begin our journey into biochemistry is that bonded elements that are sharing electrons exist in an optimal energy state and are highly attracted to each other. Thus, it always takes energy to break a bond or pull the atoms apart from one another. When new bonds form, it releases energy. This amount of energy is called the bond energy. And it will be different for different atom pairs involved in the bond and depending on what type of bond is formed. For example, a sigma bond versus a pi bond or a hybridized mixture of the two. A good example of where this concept is often misused or misunderstood is the hydrolysis of ATP. Many people erroneously state that the breaking of the high energy phosphate bond in ATP releases lots of energy. That's an incorrect way of thinking about this reaction. It is the formation of the hydrolysis product, the inorganic phosphate, that releases the energy. We will see that this mechanism is used over and over again to create energy for biological reactions in vivo.